Today we're starting a brand new series. We're going to be going through the book of John, and I am so excited about the book of John because it is an incredible book. Someone once said that if, if something happened and the Bible was destroyed and lost forever, as long as two books remained, Christianity would be okay. And those two books are the book of John and the book of Romans. One theologian said about the book of John that it is deep enough for an elephant to swim in, yet it is shallow enough for a child to not drown. What does that mean? No matter where you are in your walk with God, the book of John is going to give you something. Every time I sit down and take time to go through the pages of the book of John, God just starts speaking to me. And it's, what, what's so difficult about this series to me is there's so much stuff inside of me that I want to get to you that I've got to figure out, okay, what can they handle today? Or, or a better thing to say would be like, what can their bottom ends handle today? Because, you know, I think sometimes our rear ends get more tired than our ears do. But I just want to encourage you to listen up. The book of John was written by a man named John. John. Wow, incredible, guys. I didn't know. Like, the, the 930 service nailed it. When I was like, the book of John was written by, they nailed it. And I was like, I don't know if the 11 o'clock is going to get this. But you guys are on top of it. It was written by John, who was an apostle of Jesus Christ. He was an eyewitness to his life. John heard Jesus preach. John watched him teach. John watched the miracles happen. John watched Jesus crucified. John saw him buried. And then John saw him resurrected again. And so this is someone who knows him deeply and knows him intimately. And that is who's writing to us. And the purpose of this book is to prove the deity of Christ so that we may believe. He wants us to understand that Jesus was more than just a great teacher. Jesus was more than a prophet. Jesus was more than a miracle worker. He is God who took on flesh to walk among his creation, which is mind-blowing. And so as you read Scripture, here's what I want you to do. I want you to understand that Scripture is dealing with with signs and revelations. Somebody say signs and revelations. So when you're reading the Old Testament scripture, everything is pointing to something. Have you ever been on a road trip before? I know, Jim, you travel, you drive all the time. You're going to see, what, what do you see as you're driving down the road, hanging up? You see what? Signs. You see billboards it's advertising something or or maybe you see a sign that says x amount of miles to your destination a few weeks ago uh, my family we were we were on a road trip we we're traveling together and my kids love to stop at a little place called bucky's it's an amazing place Amen. they've got some amazing restrooms i'm just gonna go ahead and tell you if you got the do some business on the road Bucky's is the place for you, and you can grab a brisket sandwich while you're there. You can get some pork rinds while you're there. Uh, I went on a trip with Gavin one time to Florida, and he stopped by Bucky's, and Gavin always gets the most amazing snacks, and so now I'm a Bucky's snack guy. I go to the snack aisle, and I just look around, and, and so we get excited. We get excited when we see that sign on the highway that says 52 miles to Bucky's, and then it becomes like my responsibility to figure out like, how quickly can we get there? You know, how quickly can we get to Bucky's? Because the sign is not Bucky's. It's just pointing to Bucky's. I mean, if you stop at the sign and try to relieve yourself, you'll probably go to jail. And you definitely can't buy pork rinds or cashews or, or anything like that. They don't have the, the soda fountain set up at the sign. Why? Because the sign is not the actual thing. It's just pointing to where you want to go. And so all through Scripture, that's what's happening. In the Old Testament, you'll have a sign that is pointing to a better reality. So when you read about Moses delivering the children of Israel out of bondage, what we see is a sign of a greater deliverer who will come and deliver the people from their sins. When you read about King David 
it is a sign pointing to a greater king who will come and establish his throne and rule forever. When you look at water in the Old Testament, it is pointing to something. When you look at bread in the Old Testament, it is pointing to something. When you hear about light in the Old Testament, it's pointing to to something when you see the sacrifice of a lamb and the shedding of blood it is pointing to something and john wants us to know that that destination it is pointing to is jesus christ the word of god who became flesh so he's proving to us he's showing to us the deity of christ who this man is what he accomplished and what it means for us So if you have your Bible, let's go to John, the first chapter, and we're going to jump right in. And John doesn't waste time going through genealogies, which there is a place for genealogies. But John says, if you want to know who Jesus is, we've got to go all the way back to where he says, in the beginning was the Word. He says, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. So now we've got to look at this. Okay, John's talking about this word that was in the beginning, but now he's calling the word a he, and we understand that the word was with God and the word was God, and we've got to start dialing in. Who could this he be that he's talking about? He's talking about Jesus. Jesus is that word. And if you want to know who Jesus is, you've got to go all the way back to the beginning Because all things, the Bible says, were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. In other words, Jesus is not a created being. Jesus is a creator. It's important for us to understand because there are so many religions out there that will incorporate Jesus. They'll talk about him being a great philosopher, or Jesus was a great teacher, or Jesus did some miracles, but John is wanting us to know Jesus was not just a man who did great things. Jesus is God who has always been. He was not a man that ascended to some kind of high spiritual authority. He is the God who has always existed. He is the God who spoke all things into existence. If you see it and that it is good, it was Jesus. Think about that next time you look at creation, you're staring out over the ocean or you're looking at the sun or the moon or the stars or the mountains or the trees, you need to understand that Jesus is the one who created all things. Verse 4 says, in him was life. And the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness and the darkness has not overcome it. That, what does that mean? Light has shone in the darkness, but darkness has not overcome it. That means that darkness didn't take hold of it. Darkness didn't receive it. Why? Because darkness wanted to remain dark. There's just something about us that wants to keep certain portions of our life in the dark. We don't want to bring it to the light. And so instead of taking hold of the light, which is Jesus, people rejected. So now we've got the word, but the word is a he. Now we're talking about life and we're talking about light. We've got to understand that John here is pointing to a person and this person is Jesus. Now John verse six, it says there was a man sent from God whose name was John. Now This is not talking about the writer. He's not talking about himself. John is now referring to someone that we know as John the baptizer. Some say John the Baptist. It says, there was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to bear witness about the light that all might believe through him. He was not the light, but came to bear witness about the light the light. Have any of you ever been to a concert before? You'll know that like months and sometimes even a year before a concert happens, you'll have these promoters 
that start talking about the show. You know, so-and-so's coming to town. They're going to be here at this venue on this date and at this time. And then when you show up to this show that's been promoted, the first thing that happens is not the big act. They have what we call an opening act. And the purpose of the opening act is to prepare the crowd, to get them ready, to get them excited, to get them energized so that when the big show steps on the stage, the people are ready. So when we think about John the Baptist, and if you follow his narrative through Scripture, which starts way before he was even born, that there was going to be a man who was going to come and prepare the way for the light and for the way, we're looking at John the Baptist. So the Old Testament is promoting the show. Hey, this artist is coming to town. It's going to be amazing. You don't want to miss it. Then John the Baptist gets there. He's the opening act. Hey, let's get fired up. Let's get ready. And then now steps on the scene, the big show, which is who? Jesus. Jesus. Very good, man. You guys are blowing my mind today. It says in verse, it says in verse 9, it says, The true light, which is the big show, which gives light to everyone, was coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made through him, yet the world did not know him. He came to his own, and his own people did not receive him. But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right, he gave the authority to become children of God. Who were not born, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. What that means is it has nothing to do with your nationality. See, the Jewish people who the covenant was made to would say, okay, the things of God are for the children of God who are the Jewish people. But right here he's saying, no, it has nothing to do with your bloodline. It has nothing to do with your nationality. It has nothing to do with where you came from. As a matter of fact, it has nothing to do with what you accomplish. It is all about what God is going to accomplish for you so that you can become a child of God. Verse 14, it says, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we have seen his glory. We've seen it with our own eyes. You have to remember these writers here through the Gospels, they're not just hearing about this man named Jesus. This is someone that they have spent time with. This is someone that they have touched. This is someone they've had conversations with and intimate moments with. They've seen it all happen. They've say, they're saying, we have seen his glory. This is more than a man. And when you start talking about the glory here, You've got to go all the way back to the Old Testament when God decided he was going to establish the tabernacle system. The tabernacle was going to be a place of meeting where God and heaven and earth were going to be joined together. And once they established this tabernacle, inside of it was the most holy place, and this is where the presence of God came and the glory filled the temple. So when John is saying, we have seen the glory, what he is saying is, we have seen that same presence that filled the tabernacle has na now come and filled the actual tabernacle, the actual temple, which is Jesus Christ. Are you following this? John is deep. He's taking us somewhere. He's wanting us to see that Jesus is not just a man. He's the word that's always been. He created all things. He's the light. In him is life. And he is the glory of God. He is the temple of God. Now on earth, heaven has now been reconnected with earth. As you go on and you study the book of John, you'll see Jesus have a conversation with a man named Nathaniel. And Jesus will say something to Nathaniel, and Nathaniel responds with, Wow, you've got to be the Son of God. And Jesus says, Oh, you say that, you know, because I said I saw you sitting under a tree? You're going to see way more than that, bro. You're going to see the angels of heaven ascending and descending on the Son of Man. Now, when we hear that in our context, that doesn't really mean much. But if you go all the way back to the sign, 
you go back to the moment where Jacob has a dream. And in this dream, he sees a ladder. And on this ladder, he sees heaven connecting with earth. And Jesus is taking us to that place and he's saying, I am that ladder. I am the connection point between heaven and earth. Are you following this, church? This is so huge. You've got to grasp hold of what John is doing here. He's doing theology. He is showing us something and revealing to us something about this God. He says, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory. Glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. John bore witness about him and cried out, This was he of whom I said, He who comes after me ranks before me, because he was before me. The Word became flesh. God left the comfort of heaven to step into the creation that he created, And the question we should be asking is why? And the answer is to become light in darkness and life in dead places. Last week, uh, we had the eclipse. Anybody take the opportunity to watch the eclipse? My family got together. My wife got us these cool glasses, which you have to have. Well, I I shouldn't say you have to have them to watch the eclipse, but it's a really good idea if you want to continue seeing (coughs) <coughs> excuse me, that you have these glasses. And so we got together as a family and we sat on the front porch and we just stared up into the sky at the sun and we watched the eclipse and it was amazing. Well, a little bit later that night, my daughter, Isla, who's our youngest, she's just meandering through the house and she got her eclipse glasses and she put them on and she decided she was going to navigate the house in these glasses. Now, if you don't know, You need to understand, I cannot see anything right now. It is pitch black. Remember, these are designed so that you can stare at the sun and not fry out your eyeballs. So you can imagine, if you're walking around in a house that is already dimly lit in these black glasses, you can see what? Nothing. That's the international symbol for zero. Zilch, nothing, nada. And there she is. She's just walking through the house, you know, uninformed about what's going on around her. And as she's walking, she starts heading directly towards the stairs. And she gets about six inches away from the stairs, and we start shouting, stop, stop, stop. And she stops, and she takes off the glasses, and she realizes that she's about to go into a very dangerous place. Why? Because darkness brings danger. And what you have to understand is every single one of us apart from Christ, are walking around blind. We cannot see anything. As a matter of fact, the Bible says in 2 Corinthians, the fourth chapter, verse 4, it says that the God of this world, talking about the enemy, has blinded the eyes of unbelievers. That means you can't see apart from Christ, and we all fall into that category. I want to show this to you in Ephesians, the second chapter. Let's go there. Ephesians, the second chapter, let's start in verse 1. It says, and you were, this is talking about me, this is talking about you, and you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience. Let's stop right there. Are you seeing this? You are in darkness, and you are being led by darkness. Several years ago, for one of our uh, wedding anniversaries, my wife and I went to this thing in Atlanta called Dialogue in the Dark. And the idea is you go into this building, you sit down, and they dim the lights until it becomes pitch black. You cannot see anything. You cannot see your hand in front of your face. It is dark, dark. Like, I have never experienced this level of darkness in my life and as it gets pitch black you're sitting there and your guide walks into the room who is a blind person and they're going to take you throughout this facility and they're going to guide you from room to room and they're going to tell you hey take this many steps do this follow my voice and then once you get into the room they tell you okay what we want you to do is just stand there and listen and try to figure out where you are and so we're in this room you can't see anything And as you stand there, you're listening, and you start hearing, like, car horns honking. 
you start hearing the chatter of people in the background. You, you, you start hearing like the, the wheels of tires and the engines. And, and so you start putting some things together and the, the, the blind guide says, do you know where you are? And you're like, I have no idea where I am. I mean, I hear some stuff, but I don't know where I am. He goes, well, you're in New York City. You're on the streets of New York and you start going, oh, that makes sense, yeah. I'm in New York, I hear the cars, I hear the crowd, I hear the people, and then they take you to the next room and same thing, you're, you're listening to your surroundings and they let you start like filling around and touching things and trying to figure out where you are and you, again, you have no idea, where are we? And he goes, oh, you're in the grocery store. We're standing in the freezer section, you know? If you look to your right, you'll see, you will not see it, but there are Eggo waffles right there for you, you know, grab some. But the point is, you're not really there. Does that make sense? Like, at no point in time was I ever transported to New York City. At no point in time was I ever transported to a grocery store. I was standing in an empty facility listening to things, and my blind guide in the dark is telling me where I am and painting a picture and causing me to follow him through the darkness. That's what the enemy does. He is dark. We are dark. We are following darkness, and darkness gives room for deception because you don't know any other truth. You don't know truth until you see truth. You don't know what light is until you see light. I mean, did you know if you were born blind, I'm not talking about someone who like you become blind in life. If you were born blind, you have no idea what anything or anyone looks like. I could tell you and I could say, hey, people are purple. And you would go, okay, people are purple. But you don't know what purple looks like. You're relying solely on your imagination and what you can put together. Did you know that blind people dream? But all it is is their imagination telling them what something could look like. But it doesn't actually look like that because they've never seen it. Are you, are you seeing this? So you have to understand, we, we are born blind. We are born into this world as sinners. We don't, we don't grow and become affected by sin. This is the condition that we're all born into and we have no idea of what the truth is or what the path would look like and so we're just like stumbling around and the problem is you're always going to come up to the stairs and find yourself in danger because darkness will always get you into this place of danger and so that's the importance of the light that's why the light has to come because we cannot see we do not know truth and so we're following this this prince of the power of the air the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience among whom, the Bible says, we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of, of wrath like the rest of mankind. That's your nature. Apart from Christ, we are children of wrath, driven by our passion and our desires. We now see people as a commodity. You're only valuable to me if I can get something from you. Even in intimate relationships like, like marriage, it becomes what can this person do for me and as long as they're doing that for me, I'll be okay, but as long as they stop doing what I need them to be doing, I'm gonna walk away and I'm gonna find someone else. Why? Because I'm in dark. Are you following what I'm saying? Are y'all with me this morning? I'm living in darkness. I don't know the truth. And this is our nature. We are all, 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 all driven by our flesh desires. And he goes on to say, but God, I love that, being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you have been saved. What does that mean? He turns on the lights. E everything changes. What I could not see, I now see. He now shows me a completely different way to live that, 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 that makes sense. Are, are y'all with me this morning? I know that, listen, John, I understand. John is like very, very, like I said, it is very, very, very deep. But he's trying to get us to this place to where we see Apart from Christ, you know nothing. Apart from Christ, you are on a path that leads to destruction. And you have to have this light that is going to lead you in a better way. That's why Psalm 16, it says that he makes known to us 
the path of life. What is that path of life? It is this place of now I can live what life should look like to where now I am walking in this place where I am experiencing a flourishing lifestyle. And that's the point of it all. In the beginning, when God created everything, he created everything good. Intentions were good. People were good. Everything was good. But as soon as we invited darkness in, we started malfunctioning. And the love of God would not leave us in that place. So he says, I'm going to come and do for you what you cannot do for yourself. And I'm going to turn the lights on so I can lead you back into that place to where you can truly become who I intended you to become, which is not a child of wrath, but it is a son and a daughter of the Most High God. So that now you no longer live according to the prince and the power of this air, but you live according to my life and my spirit, following my way, following my direction, which will lead into life and flourishing and thriving and being productive because that's how I designed you to be. If you go a little bit further into the book of John, Jesus says this statement. He says, I am the light of the world. And when we hear that, Today, many of us go, okay, well, that's a cool statement. He's the light of the world. You know, light lights up darkness. I can put that together. But you have to understand the backdrop of what's happening around Jesus in this moment when he's telling people, I am the light of the world. They're at this feast, which is the Feast of Tabernacles. And they're celebrating the time that God led them through the wilderness after delivering them from the bondage of slavery in Egypt. And as God led them, the Bible teaches us that he led them by a fire at night. So now when they celebrate this feast of tabernacles, part of this celebration is they would light these huge candelabras. I was reading about it. It says they're something like 75 foot tall. I mean, these are monstrous candelabras, and they would light them as a representation to remember the time that God led them as fire in the night. And so when we're at this place in John where Jesus is about to say, I'm the light of the world, he's in the backdrop of this festival. He's walking around. He's seen the candelabras. He's watching people sing and rejoice about what God has done for them. And he's looking at it and he's going, you want to talk about light? I am the light of the world. I am the fire that led you by night, and I am now here to lead you back into that place of life, out of your bondage of sin, but not just the bondage of sin, but out of the system of Egypt. Egypt is a system. It represents the culture of this world. They have their way of doing things, and Jesus is saying, I'm bringing you out of that into a whole new way of doing things, and you can't do it on your own, and you'll never find your way there, So you need me to lead you and guide you and take you into this new thing to where you become my people. And that's what it's all about, church. That is what it's all about. God is always trying to bring people out from among the others and separate them to where they looked different, to where they experienced the favor and goodness of God, to where they became a representation of who God is on this earth. People mess it up, but now Jesus is like, I'm bringing you back to that place. And I'm putting my light in you so that now when people see your good works, they'll glorify our Father in heaven and they'll be drawn back to this place. In other words, once you get the light, things should look different. Jesus teaches us to pray, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. How? Through the church. The light of the world. And we are the light of the world because we have received the light. Are are you following this? So many of us think that salvation is about getting from here to heaven. I'll say this prayer so I don't go to hell. One day I'll go to heaven. And that's all it is to us. But you've got to understand, salvation is so much more than just trying to get you from point A to point Z. There is a life in the middle that God is doing something in us and through us to bring hope to a dying world, to bring light to a dark place, 
That is the mission that we are on. And we have been empowered by him because the light has now shone upon us. It has filled us. It should consume us. And it should consume every portion of our life. When Jesus came, the Bible says that people rejected him. People turned their back on him. They didn't want the light because they preferred their darkness. And sometimes we do that. We take portions of our life and we're like, I'll bring that to Jesus, but I want to keep this portion over here in the dark. And Jesus is like, no, the only way this works is to allow the light to fully permeate, permeate you to where you become a completely different being. So that now when people see you, they actually see me because we are one. I am light, you are light. I am the temple of God, you are the temple of God. Are you seeing this? We are his hands and feet right here, right now. We are an expression, a living expression of who Christ Jesus is on the earth. And we do that as the church, the body. You've got to understand how important the church is. It is the body of Christ here on earth. It's not about us just saying a prayer and then living our life and doing whatever we want and living for me. No, everything radically changes to where now it's not about me. It's about this body that I've been placed in with Jesus as the head to where we're working together to carry out his purpose and his will and his mission here on earth. And that happens by coming and saying, every portion of me belongs to you. God, every portion of my life, I want your light to hit it so that I can see things clearly. I want to see people for who they truly are, image bearers of God. You're not a commodity. You're not something that I use to advance my life. I'm not living by the system of Egypt anymore to where it's all about me, 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 me. What can I get? No, it's about what can I be a part of so that Christ can be revealed. Listen, we live in a dark world, no doubt about it. But you know what drives out darkness? Light. You are that light. I am that light. We are that light. Well, that's the end of our online experience, but listen, your journey is not over. We believe that God has a purpose, a plan, and a destiny just for you. And we've put together some resources here on our YouTube channel that we believe will help you step into that future he has for you. So take a moment, look around, let us know what you think. And if you have a prayer request, please send it to info at activationonline.org because we would love to pray with you. Well, until next week, have a wonderful day.